Okay, so I've just started the recording the session. So the session is being recorded and um, I will make it available to others uh, through YouTube and uh, others also as well. Um, I might also perhaps uh, cut it into bits and organize watch party. Because, you know, we have people from at least 45 different countries uh, in this course. So it is like it's really spread out pretty much six continents. Uh, Mona will tell you guys a lot, uh, a bit more about the demographics uh, in a bit. But we are very spread out. So being aware of the time zone differences. So what I will do is in addition to having these live sessions, uh, we will have them recorded and over time uh, we will uh, set up uh, watch parties on Facebook. Got you. All right, so I also have a poll going on right now that just it really is more for ourselves. Uh, trying to get a sense of uh, how many of you are going to be by yourselves, uh, with students. So it seems like the majority of you will be working. So, uh, so uh, working, whether you're working with students, whether you're working with colleagues, you know, any sort of an approach to education, uh, as, as you guys would know and you guys already, uh, you can't really talk about an approach to education unless you have actually experience. So, unless you actually. Have Hello, Mr. Amr. Hello, Mr. Amr. We can't, uh, we can't listen properly to your voice. We can't listen your. Uh, Hello, Mr. Amr. We can't listen to your voice properly. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. So I'm also aware, of course, that the time is of course the time in April going on until the end of the day later on. Somebody who has his number, who is right now over there, call him up on his phone. Call him up on his phone. Uh, call him on his phone. Tell him to mute everybody. Mute your mics. Can I please request that you mute your mics? Uh, we can't hear you. We can hear we you now. Hear you. But when you go back to the wards, the whiteboard, to the wards, hear you. Some voice distortion we are facing right now from your side, Amr. Sorry? We are facing voice distortion from your side. Are you? If, yeah. Can I say? Can I say must we would suggest that you come mic. closer. Okay. You yeah. must mute your uh, you mic. Can, can you organize uh, the other one, the Facebook? I think the camera will have to be on the mic. Is this better? Uh, maybe yes. I need. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe I need. Okay. Okay. Let me try one. Yeah, we can hear you from there. Let me do this. I'm going to ask Mona uh, before I introduce the rest of the course. I'll ask Mona to introduce uh, the uh, the participants a bit to you, and then a bit. Back, I'm going to do mm -hmm. some technical stuff in the background. So. Uh, uh, this is Mona. She is, of course, uh, uh, coordinating the uh, course with me, and I'm going to just uh, help her share the screen, and then I am going to go away. Um, Can we record the session on our computer? If you want to, sure. Is yes, you you'll have to give me permission. I can't um, permission. All right, let me do it. Uh, I'm recording it. I'm not sure how to allow this at this point. I think it's something I could have done before. I'll do that this um, I am recording it. Available at a later point in time. All right. So here is this here is screen and off on to Mona. Uh, you, go. No, you you have done screen share. Yes, you have right. done a screen share. You have done. That is right. Uh, Mona will go through it. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I'll just uh, we were just gonna have a brief walkthrough of the um, the participants. So this is the information that we got from the registration. 
So remember, there are like um, questions in the registration. So what we did is we collated them all so we have a sense of the data. Oh, so it's gone. Gone. Excuse me. I'm sorry. You hear me? Yeah, I, we we hear the repeating the speaker from you. So I I think you 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 turn on the speaker. Now now the screen share has come back. Yeah. Good, good, okay, good, good. Yeah. Yes. So the the voice interrupting, sir. Dr. Emma, uh, if I can suggest, could you please mute everyone and only keep yourself as the only person with your speakers on? Yeah, that's because what I've been asking. Can you please everybody mute yourself? Uh, can you please everybody just mute yourself? Otherwise, I'll have to go in through here. Yeah, there are a few you, people still whose mics are open. You, 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 you can mute everybody in you one can go. Mute everybody. Please, thank one you. Button. Just mute yeah. yourself. Thank you. Yeah, once everybody is muted, I think things will work better. Yes. Uh, also, please turn off your uh, videos. Uh, it takes up a lot of bandwidth. So if you turn off your videos and you turn off your mute and you become mute, then I think it will run much more smoothly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah. And then if you need to speak, uh, just join us, let us know uh, through the chat and we will organize it. Um, then, all right. So here it, this is. Now I'm going to go back and share the screen. Okay, so I'll, uh, I think it's happening. It's, it's like closing. Yeah. I think we just open the one in documents. Because that one is from your email. Uh, to Zoom, they have to be registered. So this this what happens when you know the <laughs> the world is very new. Yeah. So Okay, so um, so going back, so by the way, I am Mona and I am one of the coordinators of um, this course. So uh, we were gonna have a short walkthrough of the profile of the first participants based on the information that you provided us in the registration form. So, um, okay, yeah. So there are um, a total of 248 participants. And however, only 204 participants are included in the demographics. It is because, you know, um, we have to process all the information and we, but we do not want to close the registration yet. So the registration is still open, but we still, um, but we worked with the information earlier than the closing of the registration. And yeah, I think we have to download the file. We're having a little bit of problem with the file that's closing down. Okay. Okay, so, um, can you see it now? Okay. So, yeah. So, 204 participants are included in the demographics. So, if you look at um, the, the map, Okay, so this is the geographical location of all the participants. The darker the shade of purple is, the more participants they, um, they're 
is in the region. So we can see that um, it's, you know, in Pakistan, it's the darkest and Philippines is the darkest. So, yeah, and we, oh. and uh, we have participants from six continents. So all the continents aside from Antarctica. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we have, it's, we have participants dominantly from Asia. We have people from Bahrain, Bangladesh, China. Um, okay. It's in the... Yeah. I'm sorry, we're having a that to that problem. Hopefully this will work. So we have um, participants in Asia. We also have participants in um, the Americas, North America, and South America. Um, we also have participants from Africa and Europe. You see the countries that are speaking. And of course, Australia is also a participant. Um, so this is the um, pie graph of the participants, occupations, and jobs. So as you can see here, um, most of the most of the participants are affiliated uh, with institutional educational institutions. Um, most of us are teachers and tutors. Um, most of us also are instructors or le lecturers in universities. Some of us are assist assistant or associate professors. But we also have um, one of us is an editor, yeah, and yeah, most of us, majority is related to educational institutions. So I think that is the, um, that is our common ground. And this is um, a word cloud of the, of the skills and expertise. Um, most of us have um, so good skills of uh, our teachers of English. Um, also, uh, um, some of us are, are farmers, some of us are designers, some of us are like, some of us, um, like public school, photography, and other. Uh, so this is uh, the responses. Remember the two uh, questions. Uh, registration. So the first question is. Mona, can you please ask everybody to mute their microphone? Um, There's so most of the background noise. Us, um, responded that uh, we will. Uh, the, the, they think that yeah. Um, us because it will gonna be mute and make knowledge on the on methodology strategies also the uh, pedagogy and assessment on how online thing. Um, some of us would like to um, gain something about how are we gonna respond to this question mark? How are we gonna respond to the current issues of COVID-19 and COVID-19? Because um, excuse me, we in developing hear you clearly where technology is elusive and there are some areas that do not have internet connection. So how would it gonna work? And what are the other things that we can do? The third one is us want to have professional connections. So I think um, that is good. And Dr. Emma? Dr. Emma, can't you hear us? Dr. Emma, can you hear us? Sorry, is somebody talking? Yes, sorry. Yes. Dr. Emma? Yes. One second. This is Sandesha from Delhi. 
yes. you uh, you have a lot of people who haven't muted themselves and we can hear their background me, uh, noise yeah and, i keep uh, telling people to mute yeah, themselves i've no, been telling people I'm, can you please I'm, all just mute yourself here no one second dr emmer if people are not going to mute themselves you will have to remove them from the group and then you can talk to them directly later on you need to remove the people because whatever uh, just now the speaker spoke none of us could hear her clearly and if you are hosting this wait a second actually they are all mute i'm just checking exactly everybody seems to be mute right now yeah everybody is mute everybody is actually yeah. mute at the moment i just checked uh let's hope that you, you can mute everyone the drama yeah if you like you please, can mute please everyone please stay mute please stay mute all right we'll go back yeah thank you Okay, and the last one is. So what we uh, the last question is what do you think you can contribute to this course and to other participants? So the main um, yeah the main word that I that that is that arises in the. in all of the responses is sharing so everybody wants to share something every uh some wants to share um how do they how do they solve these issues in their countries or in their communities in indigenous community or how do they um yeah how do they how do they respond and how do they change the um the the way how they teach in their own communities and their own groups some of us want to share their um developed materials online materials so that is fantastic if all of us are sharing that so we can learn from each other and some of us just want to share their collaboration and want to share positive vibes to everybody so we can you know um the lockdown is very um so some of us are depressed some of us don't like it some of us we are we are okay but uh, at the end of the day we have to be we have to be tight and we have to be um yeah we can we're all in this together okay so i'll be gonna give the floor to amar again so he can um continue to the discussion all right the all right thank you mona all right so of course uh, we will have mona come in and do uh, a lot more of the content sessions as we move into phase 2 and phase 3 of this uh program of this course all right so i'm going to uh, walk us through a bit of the uh, the course outline uh, so you are all familiar with the page so if you have a look at the page with me uh, in you will find that uh, over the last 24 hours or so we have been working really hard to get uh, the phase 1 page ready and it is now ready uh so okay uh all right okay so you can see phase 1 come on phase 1 technically my page dr emma sorry to disturb you but are you aware that your screen is frozen Yes I realized that I'm just resetting it myself it is frozen. Uh Okay thank you. Okay let me re yeah I'm trying to figure it out yeah, I don't know what. Okay. All right uh if I'll see Okay. So can you see the screen now? Yes we can. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. So I've been getting this ready and what's going on with the internet? It's so slow. phase 1 okay so of course we are on the live session now you will notice that i've added a lot of uh, youtube videos as i've already mentioned in the information bit about the course i'm actually taking quite a bit of the stuff that i do with my tutors and my students in the language society and uh, power class and adjusting it and realigning it to sort of help us with this particular course as well so that in a sense i we don't have to recreate everything in a sense um, of course i have taken permission both uh, from my students my tutors as well as my head of department uh, for using this material for this course uh, so if you go to the youtube playlist 
you will uh, be able to access these videos now. You should be able to see uh, four of them at the moment. So there's some stuff that is not released to you. I mean, you can see it here in my, my screen. But what you will have access to is Emmer session two, Emmer session three, and orally session one and session two. So these uh, four sessions are in a sense in addition to the first introductory session we are going to have today. Uh, these will sort of expand on the points that I will sort of touch on today. Uh, especially then uh, Aurelie will talk about the credible uh, approach and she will start talking about different examples and going through different examples. Um, so we will also talk about the way that we have structured this course. Um, we'll talk about what we mean by deconstruction, joint construction and independent construction. Uh, you can probably see that something we have here, right? So if you see it in the schedule, uh, you will have seen that it's like you know, after the introduction, we have deconstruction, joint construction, and then independent construction. So that's the a particular approach to the teaching learning cycle. That is something that is used in the Sydney school sort of genre work, which uh, we sort of adopt in a lot of our postgraduate teaching as well. And here I've sort of adopted it in the context of online teaching. So, you know, in the introductory phase of this course, we, you know, set up what we will do uh, uh, in this course, why are we doing it? We'll talk about a bit about the underlying theory and, and issues that we need to consider uh, as we develop this work. Um, I'll set up a, a number of different sort of tasks. I will introduce you to different things we will do uh, over the, the whole course. Remember, this is a practical course, so it's, it's, it's much more engaged in sort of practice than in theory. So in addition to, I mean, I've, I've given you guys two readings uh, here, you will see them here, readings. There are two chapters. I, essentially, these are the only two readings that I think we will do uh, for the course at this point in time. I might add some more, but we will see. But really, the focus in this, uh, during this course is going to be practical activities. Now, part of that, of course, also means, especially because so many of you are lecturers and teachers and classroom teachers, and as so many of you have to just told me that you will be using uh, what we do here with your students, so in that sort of a case, what I would suggest is that as we are working through each phase, uh, you can translate this material to your context and get your students to do something very similar. So of course, if you're teaching a school context, in a school context, you will not give them the same readings as I'm giving you. Uh, but what you could do is probably simplify it, perhaps even translate parts of it or uh, uh, sort of record it in audio or a video and then share it with your students and get them to do the same activities. So essentially here we have an, a set of activities. Now, since this is the introductory stage of, of the course, uh, we will focus on six questions. Um, and these are discussion questions at this point. Um, we will primarily work through Facebook uh, simply because that allows us sort of the space and, and flexibility. But I am a very aware, I mean, we're very aware that not everybody uses social media um, or people use social media to various extent. Uh, so we will uh, also probably set up a WhatsApp group, perhaps a WeChat group, and we might, uh, we will also work through email. So uh, you can always directly email us. Um, or you can email me or you can uh, email Mona. Please notice that I've added a space between and after, before and after the ad. Uh, and that's because, uh, we don't want people to send us junk email. Um, so uh, the activities themselves at this point are just discussions, uh, questions. We don't. Uh, we will do them online as well, and we will work through. Uh, as I said, you don't need to have Facebook. We, uh, you can work through email. So as you see here, uh, you can respond to those questions via email. Uh, we will also see if we can set up another sort of a discussion forum, perhaps even on the course website. Um, if neither of, uh, of us are, are web designers. So if somebody in the group is good with internet or sort of, sort of setting up websites, I would really appreciate somebody helping us maybe add a discussion board uh, within the course website so that uh, we can just use that. Uh, or you guys can send me a uh, address. Uh, John. Okay. So I will figure out what to do. Uh, again, uh, we will have alternate uh, approaches. Uh, email works. Uh, I will also set up other things. Thank you for the questions. Padlet, Odo. Uh, all right. Uh, I will look into them and I'll organize something. All right. Maybe I'll ask you. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. So the the, uh, the discussion questions essentially are, are helping us to sort of uh, internalize and sort of really think about the readings. Uh, essentially, you will see the questions here, other than question number two, are about uh, fake news. Uh, so this is something we will do focus on in the first phase, uh, first and second phase of this course. Uh, we're going to focus on fake news uh, because uh, we're working through social media a lot and we know that so based fake news is something that operates a lot more through social media than uh, other uh, sort of places. Of course, it does in other places too, but uh, social media is, is, is a place, it's, there's a lot of it. So it's also some place in a sense we can sort of focus on and say, okay, how can we educate our students, our colleagues, our friends, family members to sort of become more sensitized to all the wrong and bad and fake stuff out there and learn to sort of identify it, uh, learn to fight, fight triggers for it, uh, and then use that information to sort of create some resources for them. Now, that's what we are going to do as part of your phase two activity. Now, to get there, we have to go through the whole process of what we call essentially project development, right? So in phase one, uh, which is the introduction in phase two, we are going to work together in a sense uh, to do sort of a project-based literature review, which is a very different type, type of a literature review. It's not a literature review that you're sort of traditionally used to, where you go to the literature and you identify a gap in the literature and you use your gap in the literature to create a research question. No, we are not going to do that. What we are going to do is going to identify an issue or a problem in the community or in the issues of, in, in, you know, where your students are, whatever it might be, you know, it, it could be so many different things. Things. And we will look through multiple examples of this. Um, I will share lots and lots and lots of examples with you. And in fact, uh, the focus of phase two will also be to get you guys to look at and, and review other additional uh, good projects uh, out there. So uh, we're going to uh, so we're going to be looking at these projects, and we are going to create a project and uh, to ourselves. And to do that, we will engage in a, a project orient, a, a literature review or a, a review for the per develop purpose of the development of the project. And the way we do this is not limit ourselves to the literature, but rather we start with the issue. In this case, it's fake news. Uh, for example, we look at what other people have done in terms of creating resources to help people. What other resources exist out there? Uh, what's good about them? What's not good about them? Uh, and what is the academic literature on fake news telling us? Uh, what you know? What are the consequences of fake news? Uh, how much of uh, how much of an issue is fake news within the specific our own communities where we live or we participate in, uh, what of sort of resources are available in our mother tongues or in our local languages in relation to that. So those are kind of things that you might want to sort of think about uh, in relation to uh, fake news. So that's the, the first thing we are going to target. And in a sense, what we will be doing in this whole process is in a sense, I will be deconstructing for you the process of developing a project. So as I'm giving you these questions and I'm setting up these questions and, and readings for you and making you sort of go through these tasks, I will also be sharing uh, ways in which uh, we can address these these uh, these concerns. I'll be sharing examples of what some of my students have developed um, over the semester, um, and uh, I'll be sharing a lot more of these resources through email, through the website, and other other platforms as well. Uh, and so we will focus on that. Now, why, why fake news? Of course, fake news is something that is very important, especially in, in the context of COVID-19. You know, a lot of people are spending much more time on social media. Our students, uh, wherever they might be, are spending a lot more time on the internet and uh, in, in social hangouts, in social contexts online. So those students are in a sense also at risk of consuming uh, this sort of stuff. So getting your students to think about fake news, and getting your students to create resources to handle and, and, and deal with fake, fake news also sensitizes them uh, to the, the fake news and gets them aware of what they consume in their own lives as well. So that's something we want to tackle uh, and that will be our first uh, sort of thing that we will work through. And as we work through it ourselves, uh, 
you can definitely get your students uh, working with you. Uh, again, as I said, uh, we won't spend too much time on the readings uh, and the theory bit, but we will, uh, that doesn't mean we don't, we will not spend any time at all. In fact, uh, I will talk quite a bit about it today, especially in, in today's session. And uh, the two other uh, uh, videos that I've shared with you, uh, these two here, Ahmed session two and Ahmed session three, sort of extend that discussion, the theoretical discussion yeah. that I plan to start here today. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I also share some examples. Now, as I was telling you, uh, in addition uh, to these questions, then uh, we've got these uh, these six questions, we've got the readings. Uh, the readings are, as, as uh, again, I've said here, they are things that Li Cheng and I have been sort of working on. These are based on some of the writings that I was doing last year. Since then, of course, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot more uh, work in this area and I'm currently in the process of sort of updating and revising these drafts. Uh, but I think at this point, they are in a shareable sort of format. So I've put them up uh, on uh, academia and uh, open them up for comments and discussions so that it can be more of an interactive sort of a session. So during this you know, phase one of the, the course, we will also have these additional sort of uh, platforms where we can discuss. So uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I do have to approve these finites, which is good actually, I get a sense of who the people are. Uh, but yeah, so this is a format where we will also continue our discussions, especially sort of the theoretical discussions. Uh, through question answers, uh, postings, discussions. Please respond to each other. Uh, don't always say, you know, wait for me to respond. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, all of you are welcome to participate here. Uh, so those are the two main readings. Uh, the first one here, let me just introduce it to you a bit. It will start off, will tell you about a bit what, about sort of subaltern linguistics. Uh, of course, you know, even though this is a course that focuses on education, uh, my own sort of disciplinary orientation of study of language. Um, so a study of language does play a role into how I see education and literacy uh, sort of evolving. Uh, my own views on literacy and language, are, I, I know some of them are pretty much, uh, they're a bit crazy, but as, I, as I've said again and again, and I've demonstrated through evidence uh, again and again, uh, there is plenty of evidence to sort of support the point that I keep making. Language, which is an oral system, and uh, writing, which is a visual system, are, are independent of each other. So we can um, communicate with each other orally without having to write. And people can uh, use a writing system, or not all writing systems, of course, writing systems such as, for example, Chinese, to uh, be able to communicate across people uh, who speak different uh, oral languages. Uh, can I please ask you guys to turn off your mics? I think somebody just turned on their mic again. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, so anyway, so we're coming back, so we'll come through this and we'll look at these readings and you will go through, uh, you will, get a bit of uh, this stuff about five senses. I will talk to you about this today uh, briefly. And as, as I talk about it, I will specifically relate it to issues of education and why I think in a sense, uh, the current sort of a time, the COVID-19 sort of a context in the course, the context of the course we are in also offers us a number of, of uh, possibilities that perhaps uh, have never really been off, uh, available to most of us uh, before. So imagine, you know, this is a time where parents and children are, are together uh, for extended period of time uh, and, and they're, they're away from their teachers. So this creates a whole different environment, right? The immediate environment of the, of the learning and the teaching is, is, is home-based, it's not uh, school-based. So that just changes all the dynamics. Uh, so, you know, when I see, uh, you know, teachers trying to take what they are already doing and just converting it into online format, I sort of feel bad about the students because, you know, imagine the students, you know, even at the best of times, the students often struggle with what's happening in the classroom. The students often struggle with what's, what the teachers are, 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 are saying, what the textbooks are, are, are stating. They're, they're struggling. That's why they're students. Now, imagine you take away Dr. all the from the Dr. teachers Emma. and everything, and, and you expect Dr. that parents who don't have training in, in teaching literacy or, or subjects to take over that responsibility in some way. You know, 
you're sort of setting it up not to work, right? You're setting it up where things are not going to work the way that you expect it to. Uh, I have muted all the mics. Uh, can you, I just, uh, I think, I don't know why people turn it on. <laughs> okay, let me just have a look again. Um, I did turn off all the mics. Please, yeah, they seem to be off, okay. Uh, just please leave them off, all right? If you press the space key, your mic can get temporary, you know, turned on. So don't press the space key. Uh, okay. Okay, so back to this session. Yeah, it's already mute. I can see it. Uh, I can see them. All right. So then it, it talks a bit more than about the application of, of this stuff in the context of education. Uh, and uh, what does that mean in terms of creating uh, different types of educational orientations? Uh, so it's, it's a pretty longish chapter, chapter, not terribly long, but it does then towards the end give examples. Uh, uh, these examples are taken from the sort of work I was doing last year. Uh, when I uh, hopefully update this chapter after the course, I will probably update examples as, uh, as well. Okay, uh, the third chapter uh, talks about the credible approach to project uh, development. Now, this is essentially a very relevant and very important. Uh, the uh, <laughs> show, right? Okay, uh, the, uh, 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 the first uh, lecture recorded by Aurelie actually focuses on the credible approach uh, and she talks uh, through it and she exemplifies it. I also exemplify it in other projects. Uh, so uh, as you can see, what we are doing is contextually relevant. So any projects that you're going to do uh, with your students or yourselves or with your colleagues, you really need to think locally. Uh, you need to be driven by needs and goals and practical outcomes. Don't, be, don't worry about the theory, right? Uh, one of the things I tell people is theory is something you need to worry about as you're sort of working through your project and dealing with it and, and thinking about it. But you don't need to start from theory for a project. You start from a real world issue, right? So fake news is a real world issue. We know it's out there. We know people fall for it all over the time, all the time. Sometimes we ourselves fall for it. You know, we are not immune either. So in a sense, uh, you can, uh, you know, so fake news is a real world issue. We need to address it and then uh, we can look at theory and things uh, once we are sort of started working on it. Uh, we have to sort of stake, engage the stakeholders. Uh, we need to talk about uh, understand, drawing, uh, drawing an understanding of local knowledge and practices. So because you know when you're dealing with, when you're creating material for a particular audience, uh, it is that audience that you need to keep in mind when you when you when you're focusing and, and creating the material it's the uh, the audience's belief systems their habits their their ways of doing things their ways of, of uh, you know things they like or not like you need to consider all those things in, in in the way that you organize your material and deliver your material so it has to be really context and based on locally based uh, and of course, while you're doing it, you want to be informed by diverse approaches and experiences. And in that doing that, remember, it's not just Western, it's everybody. Uh, I often tell people in Pakistan, you know, you have more to learn from Bangladesh and India and Nepal and Iran than you have from the UK and the US or Australia. Uh, so working through uh, these things. So again, uh, you know, we will look through fake news and look at how people have dealt with it in different languages, what sort of different ways people have designed material and we will develop ways in which we will develop our own material and that's really important right and that's where the pda comes in and uh, we will talk about pda uh, in lots more detail throughout the course uh, but we will learn to pda stands for positive discourse analysis and i'll, I'll talk a bit more about it in a bit in a bit now, uh, of course, if you're going to uh, do this work, then, uh, you know, if you're trying to address a world, real world concern, then, you know, even though you can't, you may not be able to address the whole concern, you might not be able to change the world. But what you will be able to do is be able to do, uh, make a little dent, even if it's just with yourself, right? Uh, so there is some benefit, hopefully, to the in the real world from the work that we do. So in a sense, uh, uh, our, our, you know, we don't get, our, our sort of uh, 
satisfaction doesn't come from uh, another peer reviewed publication in, in a journal. Our uh, satisfaction comes from the fact that somebody's life has been changed or has been influenced in a positive way. You know, we have, we have done something that has helped somebody. You know, you guys have created material that people have watched and through after watching that material, they were able to identify fake news and stay away from fake news. So imagine this, if you create this material, you are doing something that makes a benefit, uh, that makes a positive contribution to the world. And that is what we are hoping for because that's what benefits the community. And guess what? If you're sort of doing this kind of work in your community and, and, and you know, you're, you're, you're the one who's doing it. You're the one who's engaged. You're creating it. You're engaged with the people. You're engaged with the, with the knowledge, with the practices, with, with the material, all of it. Guess what? In a sense, you're sort of leading the, the stuff in, in doing it. You're the one who's creating all of the stuff. And, and of course, doing all of it, ethics has to be primary. It's extremely important. But remember, and I need to stress this again and again, perhaps, that ethics is not about getting you know, consent form signed. You know, very often we think of ethics as, 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 as mechanical sort of a thing where people are, are giving information about a project and then they sign off saying, okay, I'm okay, I, I'll do it. You know, sometimes, um, or, you know, honestly, I think that sometimes it's, uh, we need to think of perhaps the whole disciplines or sub-disciplines uh, as, as being question them about in terms of their ethical viability. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, for example, if you've seen some of my own writings uh, which critique linguistics, uh, I actually question the actual uh, reason for doing certain types of linguistic research. The very idea of doing that kind of research, I think, is unethical because it, pr uh, it, it produces more problems than than, than anything else. So ethics is, is, is a pretty complex sort of an issue, but uh, we really need to sort of think about ethics in relation to what we do uh, and consider uh, all the various dimensions of it uh, in, in, in how we develop our projects. So remember, we're developing all of this work with our students, uh, uh, with our colleagues, and, and we, to do this, uh, of course, the credible uh, is, is sort of a framework, it's a broad framework sort of that gives us an orientation. Now, of course, what you can also do is you can, you know, you can go out there and you can look at, uh, at other projects and you can look at other, other work out there and you can use the credible as, as a sort of a way in which you can evaluate or, or sort, of, sort of study these other projects to see if what other people are doing, are, are, how are they credible or not. And what you will find out that the projects that, uh, that seem to be uh, functioning well and, and produce uh, community benefits, you will find, uh, uh, you know, typically, uh, uh, you know, stick with the credible, you will find that it will happen again and again. You will notice how credible sort of helps you understand why a good project is a good project. And of course, by understanding how other good projects are good projects, hopefully when we create our material, when we create our own independent projects later on, this our projects will also be credible and will be good and beneficial for others. Now, of course, that's a framework uh, for developing our projects, but this has to be done within uh, what we call a, a positive discourse analysis. Now, uh, many of you here uh, might be a bit familiar with sort of critical discourse analysis, right? uh, Guys, can you please make sure your mics are turned off? Uh, Sami Christi, uh, Chisti, Sami Chisti, your mic is on. Can you please turn it off? Uh, Anybody else is, is it, mic is on, please turn it off. Um, okay, so, uh, so po it's positive discourse analysis is sort of a complementary approach to uh, com critical discourse analysis. Uh, what it in sort of mean, way means is of course, you know, uh, what we're doing in this project is, is through the kind of work we're doing is we're trying to really empower the community, right? So in that sense, if you think of Paulo Ferreira's work and you think of critical pedagogy, then we, we are very much aligned with the sort of idea of, of, of community empowerment and betterment of, of the people uh, who we live with uh, and around us. Uh, because if the world, if people are better off, then the world is a better place. Uh, so we're definitely aligned with that idea, but uh, we're not necessarily going to approach uh, uh, we're not necessarily going to try to do it the same way as sort of CDA does it or how sort of Paulo Freire sort of thinks about critical pedagogy. But what we're going to do is, is something slightly different. Uh, so we're going to really focus on, on a practice uh, and we're going to work not just through language but through social semiotics. 
and we will talk about that in a bit. So what positive discourse analysis does, so instead of sort of doing CDA where you identify the problems, where you, where you look at a text and see, here are the problems, here are the issues, you know, these are why, this is the reasons why the world is such a crappy place. You know, CDA helps you sort of identify all that stuff, you know, you can find the evidence uh, uh, through language of, uh, to support why these texts have, uh, have created the, pro the problems that we have today. So there's a lot of CDA out there and it, it does a great job in identifying problems. But you know, what it doesn't do necessarily is give us examples of solutions. So positive discourse analysis and especially broad positive discourse analysis, which is what we will focus on in this course, there is something called a narrow PDA, narrow positive discourse analysis. Um, and Aurelie will talk about it uh, during some of our lectures, but we won't work on it. We will work with a broad positive discourse analysis, which means we're going to look at things that have been successful. We're going to look at campaigns that were successful. We're going to look at uh, flyers and, and brochures on videos and other stuff um, that have been successful. And we're going to say, how was this thing? How did this thing become successful? So instead of identifying and saying, how did this problem become a problem or why does this problem exist? Uh, we are going to inverse that and say, why is this good practice the way it is? How do we make good practice? Uh, you know, how do we make good practice? What are the ways in which we do it? What are the strategies? What are the, the tools? What are the social semiotic resources? We're going to identify all of that and we are going to use that to develop our own material. So what we will be doing is positive discourse analysis. So here you will find uh, discussions of positive discourse analysis, how to do it, uh, and you will find this little chart. And this is uh, we're going to look at again, notice we are going back to the sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste. Uh, I will talk about these in a minute. And then how, are, how is sight utilized? How is the notion of sound utilized? For example, if you're using it, looking at an ad campaign and you see images of food, delicious food with steam rising up from it, right? It gives you a sense of both smell and taste. So the image can actually metaphorically in a sense, create a sense of a smell and taste and uh, that connects to us. And of course, uh, each thing, has a particular meaning. So if it's smell of something delicious, notice I said delicious, then it's something that we like, we get a positive uh, opinion about it, we get a positive uh, orientation to the issue. But imagine if the smell is something that's dirty and rotting, uh, then uh, of course the meetings that are projected are negative. So notice it's not just language that does it, it's all of these other sites, and all of these, these, these systems. And that, of course, is, is crucial for us. And in a sense, that takes us back to chapter two, where I sort of skipped this earlier, and now I will come back to it uh, and, and talk about this little table here. Uh, so this is my attempt to sort of work the five senses into a way of theorizing uh, the world into two sort of con sort of categories. Of course, I, always oversimplifying things, I know, I realize that. But it's sort of trying to say, there's, there's a world that's material, which includes the biological world, right? So anything that's living is material as well. Um, and, but of course, there's a lot of stuff out there that's not material, right? So ideas, thoughts, all these things are, are about things which exist, but they are not material in the sense they don't exist here and now. We can't sense them in any way. Uh, so those things uh, are socio-semiotic, uh, uh, and so they're, they're, uh, they're different from material systems. So the material world and the non-material world are two different worlds. Uh, and notice the fake news operates through the non-material world. It's much harder to lie through the material world. Of course, it's possible, uh, but it's much more difficult to lie through uh, all the different sensory systems, especially through touch, taste, and smell. Uh, it's easier to lie through sound and sight. It's especially easier to lie, lie through text uh, or the written language because when you're dealing with the written language, the reference of what is being talked about in the text is not available to you within your physical environment. So therefore you can't test, taste or smell it, right? So you can only see a reference to it in a textual form, which is, 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 is symbolic in a sense, right? So 
notice how language and text, especially written text, takes us away from the here and now into another world. Now, what that means, of course, uh, is that there is a huge possibility of exploiting that space to tell us things that are not true. Um, and that is essentially how fake news operate, right? So fake news operates through a disassociation of the information from our real experiential life. So once you move things away from taste, touch, and smell, you are open up the possibility of much uh, people being misled much more easily than, uh, than you are through these things. Uh, notice, of course, this is uh, something I talk about in this uh, article as well, and something else that I'm working on at the moment, is that the sort of the current forms of education uh, have become extremely dependent on the visual and the literacy format. Uh, we've sort of lost track of the other sort of sin systems, especially, you know, we hardly ever think about a smell, touch, and taste uh, in the context of schooling or education. But of course, they are very, very important, and we know that, right? So, for example, an overcrowded school means it's going to be icky, you know, smelly, perhaps, uh, not a lot of space, uh, all those things, you know, it, it won't give us a good feeling, and that will impact our learning as opposed to some place that's nice and clean and smells good. Uh, you know, uh, if, you're, you know, if you're in a school where you don't have good food, you know, the, the hygiene of the food is bad, that's going to impact your health, that's going to impact your learning. Now, we don't think about these things often, but you know, because we sort of think about education as being through reading and writing and listening and speaking uh, uh, and, and nothing else. But what I'm sort of trying to do here is say that, hey, wait a second, you know, what you're thinking of language and text are essentially sound and sight. They're actually group A and, and group A is about stuff that's really far from us. So things that are very far from us, you can make, you know, you can play around with them because there's not, they're not around us, especially when it comes to recordings and, and writings but other systems are not the same way so it's strange that we do ignore the physical reality of, of our st students' lives and, and learnings. If, for example, in the case of COVID, the physical aspect of their being at home with their parents and siblings and, and care providers, and what that means in the context of their everyday life, in the context of their learning. How can you integrate, for example, issues around elements of food around our learning? So, you know, I was talking to one of my friends earlier today, who's, who's been sort of giving activities to his nieces in, in Pakistan, and, and I was telling him, you know, if, if, if you've got nieces or nephews uh, who are like seven year old, eight year old, sort of one of the things you can do is, is create activities around, around things like uh, a cookie, a cookie containers. So, for example, imagine if you tell kids, all right, uh, we, you know, go and you know, get your parents to figure out, uh, you know, get, get a, get, imagine that you have your favorite pack of cookies. Now, if you don't have one, that's okay. You can look it up on the internet. You can find a Google image of it. Right, so now you've got your favorite cookies. Now look at the ingredients of the cookies. What ingredients does the cookie have? Now, for each of these ingredients, now with your parents and with your parents, look up what, what these ingredients are. What are the health benefits? What are the risks? What are, you know, what's a good amount to consume? What's not a good amount to consume? So create activities around sort of these everyday material that children find at home, right? So th these are things that they eat. These are the cookies that they love. And guess what? When they love, go through these ingredients, when they start seeing, all oh, right, wheat, of course, there are benefits and things, you know, this, this, all this stuff. But then they start looking at, you know, sugars, all, all these kinds and, and other things. And they start looking at, looking at sugar and what sugar is and what sugar does to your body that actually educates them about sugar. Now, imagine how often do we actually tell children in our schooling context that high sugar food is bad for you. It's poisonous for you. Right. We don't do it because our textbooks don't have a chapter on, on sugars. Our textbooks don't have a chapter on discouraging children from eating sugars because that's just not the way those textbooks work. Right. But now it's, it's, it's a different or a sort of a context altogether. So you're creating a, a, a lesson plan and activity where students are working at home, looking at ingredients of various things that they like eating and they are keeping a table of what things they eat over a day, what are the ingredients, then they research with their parents or their siblings and make it interactive 
get the parents and the siblings and the care providers involved. You know, and if literacy is, is, is not very high, then you have to think about other ways, getting oral support to them, uh, using audio supports. You know, a lot of people use WhatsApp now, uh, and WhatsApp is something that is available to people who have you don't even have to have a very smartphone to sort of do that. So there are technologies I know that are available for, for many people in many communities through which you can create oral less, lessons plans. Use the mother tongue as much as possible now. Remember, you're not in any school environment, so you're not bound by the school rules in the same sense. Use the mother tongues. Use whatever the local languages are, whatever languages you share with the children. Use those now. Get them to do all those things with their parents. Get the parents to tell their children stories, right? Uh, we know that you know, our narratives are, are, are so important, that our narratives, our own lives are very important. But very often, we don't get a chance to get involved in all of that, right? So you can create activities around, you know, around household products, around, you can get children to write the biographies of, of people at their home, you know, where were their parents born, where did they grow up, some interesting facts. You know, you can have uh, activities where children, uh, if, if the parents are working from home, then the ch children can actually spend time with the parents uh, to see what their, their learned parents do and the parents can explain to the children what they do. And you can create activities around those sort of things. So in a sense, what I'm saying is getting things organized and practices made around things where the students are based at this point, which is at their home, right? So you notice what happens. And, and you know, this is something which I, I, I think is a really good opportunity uh, uh, some of you who, who, who know me, I've been following some of the stuff that I've been, I've been doing. You might remember last year before Ramadan, I posted a question, a, a challenge essay saying, is saying that why is it that when, you know, in, in Islam, uh, children are not supposed to be taught or educated at all until the age of seven and nothing is required until puberty, then why is it that children in the Muslim world uh, the parents in the, uh, in, the, in the Muslim world send their kids to school at an age of three or four, including to madrasas. Isn't it sort of un-Islamic to have these institutions because you're not supposed to send kids to formal education? Uh, now, I mean, of course, nobody answered that question. And, and the reason nobody answered the question is because there is no answer. Uh, there is a contradiction in how the people live their lives and, and what they claim, in a sense, to believe in. And, and that is, in a sense, uh, the contradictions that we find around us all over the place. You know, we live in a world where we are make contradictory decisions all the time. I mean, not all the time, but quite, we do have to make them at times. Uh, right? So for example, belief in uh, don't, you know, early education should be at home, yet sending children to schools. So sort of that contradictory sort of behavior. Now, why do I say that actually is a bad thing? I mean, forget about religion, but uh, in a, for a second, and just thinking about why is it that it's really good that children are at home. Because, you know, when you look at children and how children learn, what you realize is children learn through going from, bot from taste to touch, from low proximity and high ingestion to low ingestion and high proximity. So learning happens this way, right? So for example, <sighs> you learn to know who your mother is to touch and taste and smell. You know, there are pr plenty of studies, uh, you might have seen videos yourself, uh, where, you know, they have kids, uh, very young children, infants, who are, uh, you know, who are let go in a room where they're blindfolded and there are many women there, and the child is always able to identify their mother. Uh, and why? Because, you know, children use taste, touch and smell to make meanings. Uh, you know, sound comes later, language comes later. Sight, of course, I mean, these things are evolving, right? Sight develops, develops in time. Uh, but the use of sight for reading and writing is something that's very, uh, very late in development, right? And in, in, in some cultures, in some communities, uh, there is never a need for a writing system. So notice that most languages in the world, which languages are oral, uh, most languages in the world do not have a writing system. Uh, there is just no writing system at all. Uh, so of course, uh, if you look around you, then uh, of, of people around you, what you will find that a lot of people who speak these languages uh, come from background where the very idea of literacy doesn't exist, right? It's not even a concept. So. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, so what we want to do is we don't want to rely on literacy in the way that we do education because we should, we realize one that literacy is a different 
a sensory system. It's not the same as language. Uh, you know, you can have uh, writing systems that are totally independent of sound systems, such as Chinese. Uh, and, and we can also realize that actually sometimes literacy can be used uh, to, um, uh, literacy can be used to sort of uh, uh, trick us into believing things that shouldn't be. <laughs> All right, so, So we want, actually somebody just said a question that education has become irrelevant and absolutely that is what we are trying to do. We want education to be relevant. I mean, the question that your student is asking is, is fantastic. It's, I would say this, it isn't that education is becoming irrelevant today because of the world of COVID-19. In fact, if you want to think about it, it's cool school style education is irrelevant like in most cases, <laughs> right? It doesn't prepare our students to be able to do things, our children to be able to do things or fulfill the needs of the community, to be to have skills and practices that they can actually apply in a real context. Uh, but, uh, you know, nonetheless, that's the kind of education there is very often, right? So uh, we want to move up. So this is, uh, in a sense, way we can use this way to sort of thinking about education and why is it that we can actually create approaches to education that at this point don't rely on literacy. We know that our many parents, and especially if the parents are in the, uh, uh, you know, in, in the developing world or if, if they're in, in the working classes uh, or if they're in the indigenous communities, then it's very likely that the parents have very low literacy uh, and if the literacy rates are low, then of course that means that you as a teacher can't expect them to, to fill the gaps that you will have, right? So the best thing then to do is create a whole different type of an assessment project. Do not depend as much on reading and writing. Depend more on doing things, creating things. You know, uh, one of the things that we ask for is like the kind of activities that you guys do, right? Now, that's something that you might ask your, the parents of your kids. What are the kind of interests that your, the parents have from your, of your kids? What are the kind of skills that they have? Do they, do, are there people out there who are good at furniture making? Are there people out there who are good at plumbing? Are there people out there who are good at, you know, carpentry? Are there people out there who are good at other sort of stuff, right? Dancing, singing, other sort of exercises, all these different things. Now, the reason we want to know about these things is because those are the kind of skills, the things that you're really interested in that you can really turn into, into projects right now, creating assignments, creating modules, creating activities around things that interest you. And, and, and that's the sort of things that are, are because things that are in, of interest to you are things that are real world things, right? It's not irrelevant stuff. This is stuff that matters to people's lives. It's stuff that make, makes things that is interesting to you. So imagine if you've got a school where you've got parents who have different skills, can you not involve the parents to create sort of activities where children make things at home? Right, of course, we need to realize that different social classes, there will be variations. But again, you can do things at home, create things with the resources that are available at home. Right, so, you know, I, I grew up, uh, you know, in, in, in not a very rich or a middle class family, sort of a, you know, lower middle class family background. I didn't have a lot of toys and things. You know, what did we do? We created things, we made things. Uh, we, we converted things that are plain, normal, everyday things but then turn them into magical beings, right? That's how kids' imaginations work. Now, this is a chance to let that imagination sort of play with that imagination if you work with kids. Uh, explore them, let them explore their imagination. Don't curtail them by writing. Don't get them, don't tell them your spellings are wrong. Uh, you know, you, you don't have the right structure. Get them to do things creatively, tell them to create something, draw something, make something, build something, then take a picture and send it to you. Then record uh, an audio of what they made and how did they make it, why did they make it, how did their family members or people in the house help them. They can just record a little text. They can even interview their siblings and, and their parents and they can share that recording with you. I mean, that's activity, right? That's getting the kids engaged, getting them to do things at home where they are with people who they're with. And, and by through that, building those relationships. So one of the things that unfortunately happens in today's world is when you've got, you know, children, as I said, start learning from taste, touch, smell. Now imagine when, well, that's how we learn. And, and we learn for the first, we, we learn all our lives, but we learn at a very rapid rate in the first like seven to 10 years of our lives, right? What, uh, uh, there's a huge difference between a five-year-old and a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old. 
right? Huge gap. Not as much of a difference between a 47 and a 49, right? But it's a seven and a nine huge difference, right? So people are, children are learning really rapidly, really quickly. And so sort of what happens then is when the kids are taken away from the home environment in a sort of a normal traditional schooling system, and there it is all replaced by sight and sound, uh, what happens essentially is all the physicality of learning is removed but not just the physicality of learning. You, what is also happening is, is, is a, a physical removal of the child from the parents or the care providers and the siblings. That weakens human relationships, right? So when you've got a child who starts spending hours away from the house, uh, you know, every day of the, week, of the working week, sometimes four hours, five hours, six hours, uh, you know, and the child is maybe three and a half, four years old, five years old. Guess what's happening? This is the time they're spending away from, from their home, from the community, from the people, from the families, from the people who love them. And as, as, as they're removed from that, in a sense, their bonding and their relationships are transformed. Now, of course, also notice, you know, what children learn at home through engagement with the elders and siblings and through play, through the five senses cannot be replaced by something that only comes through text and writing and reading and listening. It just cannot be replaced, right? So a, a, a suppression of our, you know, some of our material senses, the most intimate of our material senses, and, and replacement of them by the most least intimate of the material senses is a problem in education. Uh, and this, in a sense, the COVID or environment, in a sense, gives us an opportunity to work beyond this particular context and, and create uh, ways of doing things which may not be, have been possible uh, before. So you can see, you know, we've got tons of uh, opportunities, tons of possibilities, but notice also, of course, going back now, notice uh, these, these five senses, the sensory system here that I've sort of described. What I've done in chapter three is I've converted that into the positive discourse analysis. Now notice what we're doing. We are taking the material senses here and then describing how these material senses are being used through the visual stimuli, whatever the stimuli are, you describe the stimuli of what's happening, how is touch being realized through a video or a text, right? Is it being described? Is it being shown, right? Um, it, right? Or, 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 so looking at all those things and then what meanings are projected by it. So touch can be, you know, comforting, touch can be disgusting, uh, depending on the nature of the touch. So what meanings are projected through what touch? So again, what we are sort of doing is creating a sensitivity to, for people to realize that meanings are made not just through language or through text, meanings are actually made all of our sensory systems and subsystems. So it's not even just one aspect. So right, for example, touch gives us a sense of temperature. Is it too hot or is it too cold? And we will take action based on whether it's too hot or too cold. Right, so what does that mean? It means that we are uh, using touch to make meanings and then we're using those meanings to make, uh, to do things. Or imagine this, somebody touches us, our parents touch us on our shoulder, giving us a pat. We, we feel proud, we feel happy, it's, it's a pat on the back. But imagine if somebody sort of in the bus or the train touches us who doesn't know us, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not appropriate, right? It's, it's disgusting, it's not, not right. So touch has different meanings. Uh, so each meaning is, is, is different and each meaning is context dependent, right? It's who touches you, where they touch, how they touch, what interpretations you have, where you are, all of those matter in how you interpret that particular sensation of touch. Imagine, it's similar in sight, right? So when we see things, when we see colors, you know, green can mean uh, green as grass, green can mean green as new, green can mean novice, green can mean so many different things. Uh, a text, a written word, a set of sounds can mean different things in different languages. They can mean different things in the same language, right? So you can see all these, these things happening through, uh, through all these different senses. Language is just one. So language, oral language is just one aspect of sound and written language is just one aspect of the visual. There's a lot more uh, that's happening. Okay, so, uh, 
yeah, I just realized it seems like there was happening some, but actually nothing terrible happened, hopefully. Anyway, so coming back, uh, you see, so these are the two readings. I want you to sort of go through them. Um, and as you go through them, there are examples here. And I will also be sharing additional examples with you. Uh, some of them through Facebook, but other through other media. Thank you again for sharing your, through your comments, other resources I can also look through. Okay, let me stop sharing. Okay, so, okay. Okay, can you please just turn off your mics? Good, yeah, mics are off, good, fantastic. All right, so coming back to here. Um, I'm going to take pause uh, and I am going to ask you guys if you have any questions at the moment. And then if you don't, then I will continue. But I will give you a moment. To, uh, you can either type your question or you can uh, uh, say it. There is a question from Rizwana in the chat box. Yes, can you tell me which question is that? Can you please let me know? I'll read it for you. Okay. Yeah, sir, I would really appreciate it if you shed some light on the formal aspect of education where students in colleges and universities are attending classes online for their course and studying course content prescribed to them. Uh, absolutely. This is where I think our creativity and chance to cre be creative lies. So I understand that the schools and the colleges, of course, have their curriculum and that's what they want the teachers to do. But it's not a school setting. It's not the same environment. So in a sense, you also have the freedom to talk about how you achieve the same goals. Uh, so you have the curriculum goals, but how do you achieve those goals in a totally different way? Right, so think about this way. If you, we were talking about that activity about getting kids to do, look, identify ingredients from a cookie packet and then research those ingredients and, and, and learn about those ingredients, right? Uh, isn't that in a sense science? Uh, isn't that in a sense, uh, uh, you know, looking at ingredients? Isn't that also language where they're sort of reading and learning about ingredients? Isn't that also sort of writing or presenting where they're sort of sharing that information, presenting that information, writing about that information? So in a sense, you still have your reading and your writing and your speaking and your listening. All those things are still happening. You still have your content, right? You still have your language, you have science, you have your math, you have your history, you have your whatever subject it is that you teach. Uh, linguistics, uh, you know, philosophy, it doesn't really matter. Sociology, uh, whatever the subject it is, you still have the subject, you still have everything. All you're sort of doing is changing what you do as, as, as part of your activity, as part of your goals and your assignments, uh, how you structure your readings, how you structure your assignments. So what we are saying is not that we are not teaching our students how to read or write, we are, but we're not giving that the priority. We're not saying that's the only thing we want to do. Right, it's, it's one of the tools that we will use and uh, it's also a recognition that some people are gifted with literacy and others are not, right? So we know that people have multiple intelligences and we respect those multiple intelligences in, 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 within our pedagogical approach to realize that there are going to be some students who are going to excel in reading and writing and others who will not. Uh, but others who do not may be really good at, at you know, artwork or they might be good at singing or music or, or, or is cooking, or, you know, who knows, or something else. Now, the question is, do we have a space within our curriculum, within our, our teaching and learning material that allows uh, us to create material and engage our students to be able to uh, help the students who have those different skills to, to benefit from those skills and those expertise and to excel through our educational context using the skills that they have rather than trying to force them into something they, they're not good at, right? It, now we especially know, especially with literacy in, in context where the community itself overall has low literacy, you know, you can't expect much from those children in terms of literacy because they're not exposed to it in their communities. They're not, or, they don't have the orient, orientations to it, which, which you expect them to have within a school context. So now if they don't have those literacy, uh, you know, skills, and if you can't expect those literacy expectations from, from these people, uh, and yet you want to maintain the curriculum as if they have it, 
then you're creating up an educational scenario where the students are going to fail or suffer, or they will do stuff and pass through the motions and get their credits and yet not know the subject. Now, uh, you know, in, in the work that I've been doing across the world, this is not atypical, you know. Uh, I can give you examples from pretty much every country that I have worked in so far in my life, where it's, you know, it's pretty obvious in so many contexts that the students are doing things, they're reading material, they're doing activities that have no relationship with their real lives at all. Uh, you know, it's, it's just totally devoid of any relationship. Now, in a sense, this is a chance for us to revise it. You know, we would never have this chance within the normal context of education because the system is too strong for us to do uh, At this point in time, we have that flux, we have that flexibility where things are, everything is sort of in a flux. So in a sense, it also means there are options and avail possibilities available to us, which are typically not available in a, in, in a regular context. So that's sort of what my thoughts are in relation to this. And I think that's where we can sort of work together. Uh, people who are here, of course, uh, interacting, participating in the live event, but also those who we will sort of share this with. Um, you know, I will organize a watch event and then uh, we will have, this, we'll set up other discussion panels as well and groups as well. And again, if somebody is good with internet and websites, please email me and I will love to have you help me with that, uh, that uh, aspect of the project. Anyway, uh, that's it. I hope that answers that question, uh, and I'm happy to answer other questions. I'm good with it. Can you please turn off your mics if you're not speaking? Dr. Ember. Dr. Ember? Yes. Uh, hi, this is Sandesha. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, Sandesha, I can. Okay, hi. Um, so, hello, everybody. I have a question with regards to activities that can be done through these um, online print, uh, whatever modes that we're using. Um, I'm planning to use Zoom for a particular session that I'm be that I'll be conducting today. This is with regards to a project uh, for indigenous languages. It's an endangered language. And I was trying to figure out because it's something I'm just uh, chartering basically in something that I've never done before. The fact that I'm using technology, the fact that I'm using it with people who are using it for the first time, and the methodology is obviously going to change. To get the kind of group and to also to make sure that the group is secure was another challenge for me. The last two days I have been spending just trying to make sure that the group is secure. I have been spending one day trying to teach the 10, 15 people as to how to use Zoom. And now currently I'm uh, working on the methodology. So I'm initially planning it as a uh, once or twice in a week session. I'm trying to get the actual speakers of that indigenous language to take the course. This, would you, I mean, I'm looking at this as a pilot project for the community. And accordingly, I'll share the methodology. So what I wanted to know is with your experience or with the experience of the others in this group, how should I go about with activities? Because when you're talking about language, language is something that requires not only this listening part, we want them to have the input to give the output. We want that if it's a 40 minute session, because I'm using a basic Zoom one, where I'm using a free one right now. So in that, if I'm looking at 40 minutes, I'm looking at the planning of the time as in like 15 minutes for the teacher or the tutor of the session to take the course. And then accordingly, the remaining 15 minutes by putting them in like 10 minutes for an activity and putting them in breakout rooms, which I learned recently, which happens in Zoom, and then getting them to give that feedback. And then every, every day I'm planning to give them a task with every session. So could you please uh, maybe give me some other ideas that could help me improve? Thank you so much. Dr. Ahmed, we can't hear you, sorry. Dr. Emmer, you're on mute. Please repeat. All right. Yes. Okay. A great question. Now, let's let's take that question and let's let's imagine that we want to create a project uh, for for people uh, who speak different indigenous languages, and you have an online course with a group of people in an indigenous community. Uh, let's imagine that. Of course, let's imagine we have three months uh, with them. Uh, again, I don't know the exact timeline that you have, and we'll have to adjust things around those things, but. Uh, instead of thinking of like, okay, so I do this assignment with them every day, every day they do this, this, and then today they do this, tomorrow they do this, then they do this. 
I, I'd like to think about it as one project for the whole course, right? So at the end of the whole course, the students will be able to create one project, right? Now, in order to create that one project, I am going to parse my course into phases or, or sessions or groups or however you want to say it. So now notice, and, and I think this is, uh, I'm going to use my own course design in a sense to help you sort of see this. Let me share my screen again. Uh, so if you go here, you have, the, you have the four phases, right? And so for each phase, I say deconstruction, joint construction, independent construction. Now, notice what I'm doing here. In this first phase, we are going to build a shared set of theoretical knowledge and positions, sort of a shared way of doing things and approaching different uh, socio-semiotic systems and material systems. And we'll do a bunch of activities that are all going to be based here. So notice, right, so you have in phase one, you have uh, all these uh, different uh, uh, things. You have different videos. And for each of the videos, there will be different sort of questions and discussions that you will be part of. And then you have these discussion questions here, right? So all of this is, again, these questions are slowly taking you towards question six. Now, question six, is in a sense moving us towards the next phase. So what material can you create to make people realize that they need to pay attention to the credibility and reliability of what they consume on social media and the internet. Now, from doing a review of the material, thinking about the material, thinking about what's good, what's bad, thinking about the context of people. Now here, for example, in the context of indigenous populations, you are actually working with people who have low literacy perhaps. Uh, perhaps the indigenous languages that you're working with have no writing system at all, right? So there is no literacy. So that becomes a very relevant question, right? So how do you deal with it? So these are sort of questions that you discuss with them over a period of time. And then once you've sort of done that, then they're getting to the point where they're thinking about what it is that they will develop, right? And then after this, we will have the whole, oh, sorry, where did I go? Uh, Yeah, we have this whole second phase two, which is the deconstruction phase where we will go through and apply looking at multiple examples of credible projects. So even though they are thinking about what they will do, they're not doing anything yet. They're sort of looking at what's done, looking at projects, different examples, looking at all of that, and then moving towards a phase two activity. So to complete phase two, you will work to develop resources to help people identify fake news. Now, this is the activity your people can do within an indigenous community. They can develop projects, uh, material in their own indigenous language to help their own community members learn about fake news and stay away, uh, try to identify and protect themselves from fake news. So in a sense, your, your students are creating that material. Now, when they're creating the material in the indigenous language, what are you doing? What you're doing actually is you're creating, you're, you know, if, if in a sort of a traditional sort of a language policy sort of a sense, people call that, uh, uh, you know, uh, where you're creating material and resources. Uh, it's a particular kind of uh, language policy. Uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, corpus planning, right? You're creating material for the language. So in a sense, what you're doing is creating material in the language. So you're in a sense documenting the language as well, but the documentation is not through a description of nouns or verbs or morphemes, but that this documentation is through pre presentation of material for educational purposes. So you are in a sense creating uh, that information. Uh, okay, so, uh, so we will look at examples of fake news. There will be tons of stuff on fake news uh, as you look through the material that is on uh, uh, your uh, Google, uh, sort of the, uh, the education in the time of COVID YouTube page. You go through these different sessions. Again, these four videos are available to you at the moment. As you go through these uh, videos and looking at the material associated with it, uh, they will show you more examples and more material. I will also share additional resources and material with you. Uh, and so will my students. Uh, I haven't really actually yet introduced the whole group of people. Uh, I've introduced Mona to you. Uh, and uh, right, so I'll just go here. Uh, 
and you've already been introduced to Mona. Uh, we also have Lee, Cheng, and Aurelie, who are my uh, tutors working with me on my language society and power class. Aurelie is also working on her PhD with me. And for her PhD, she's doing a positive discourse analysis, uh, focusing on uh, looking, evaluate, reviewing the tobacco, anti-tobacco campaign in Australia and sort of working towards an anti-sugar campaign. Uh, of course, I am also highly thankful to the students in Language Society and Power class. Uh, these are students both from last year, this year, also the years before. Uh, so, sort of a ton of this material and thinking that I've done is in relation to, to the students and my classes. But not just that, I also want to acknowledge all the other various people I've worked with uh, across the world over the years who have contributed to this kind of development of the project. Right, so, um, so you will listen to her lectures. They're all here, so you get Aurelie's sessions here. Um, I will also ask Aurelie, Li Chang, Mona, and some of my students uh, to organize tutorials with you guys. Uh, not right now, because I think it's too early at this point, but as we go move into phase two, we will start organizing tutorials and, and other activities uh, that we will do. So for now, we will focus on the fake news. If you're working with your students, you can start getting your students to think about fake news, uh, looking at fake news. Uh, I will share again more resources um, on fake news. Uh, and then that's where we'll start. Uh, we will work through fake news, we will work through. And then uh, for the joint construction phase, we will shift our focus. So that's the deconstruction, right? So the deconstruction phase, we will sort of work through, look through and then create uh, material for fake news, then for the joint construction, uh, we will work together to create some resources perhaps for an anti-sugar campaign. And then in the fourth phase, that's your independent phase. And notice these are the variable and dates, right? So the first three phases are pretty structured, three weeks, three weeks, three weeks. But after that, I've, I've left it open a bit because I know that pe different people are working in different areas, doing different things. So we will keep that flexible and open and we will negotiate the end dates with all of you. Anyway, I'm conscious also it's time, it's 5.30 almost, the session is supposed to run from 4 to 5.30. So I want to thank you everybody for participating. Again, I am also learning how to manage this better. Uh, you know, uh, so it's Mona and yeah. we will all do that. So please bear with us. Uh, I hope that uh, also I've, uh, I've extended the, uh, I've extended the registration deadline because a lot of people were emailing me. So now registration is open until the 20th of April. Uh, so another five days. And then, uh, yeah, so stay, stay in touch uh, and email us if you have questions. Again, there's Facebook. We will shortly create a WhatsApp group as well. So if you send us your WhatsApp number in the registration forms, we will use that information and create a WhatsApp group for us as well. And then we will share that information with others. So if other wants to join, they can join as well. All right, so stay in touch. Uh, and uh, next week we will uh, perhaps organize, uh, uh, you know, shorter sessions uh, with, uh, with different, different time zones so that people from different areas can, can log in and I'll try to involve other people as well. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great uh, week, have a good weekend. And again, if you have questions, uh, comments, just uh, please feel free to share them with us. All right, thank ciao, you. bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you from Bangladesh. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you from Bukidnon. Ah, wow. hi, Bukidnon. We miss you. Hello. Hi. Yeah, we too. <laughs> thanks for Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you. From Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.